So welcome and thank you for attending the Grad Project presentations. Uh, it's wonderful to be able to share my project with you. I've had lots of fun doing this. Um, my project is called Stepping Stones, Taking Indigenous Reconciliation from the Pews to the People. Before we begin today, I'd like to acknowledge that there are people participating uh, today from all across the Great Turtle Island. And I am, as you can see from the large arrow on the screen, uh, pointing to my location on Treaty 4 territory, home of the Sotu, Nakota, Dakota, Lakota, Cree, and Métis Nation. Let us all recognize and live into our responsibility to care for creation in a way that honors those who came before us and also those who will come after us. The question I decided to pursue for my grad project uh, was how do clergy help their communities of faith navigate the journey towards reconciliation with Indigenous peoples in Canada? The information gleaned from my research is meant to act as stepping stones, as representations of the path available to bridge the gap between those who desire to work on reconciliation with Indigenous people and those who have lived marred by disrespect, lack of trust, and generational trauma. Before we go any further, there's three definitions that I thought we need to make sure that we're on the same page for. Um, the first is Indigenous peoples. For this presentation, the term will refer to Canadian individuals who are First Nations, Inuit, or Métis. Congregation refers to people who attend church for worship or other spirit-focused activities. And thirdly, reconciliation. While there's many different types of reconciliation, during this presentation, all references to such will imply Indigenous reconciliation. To best access the information that people carried with them as part of their lived experience, I used a phenomenological approach, which involves forming generalizations based on specific incidents, exper specific incidents experienced, observations made, or facts known to be true or false. I put a call out to United Church ministers um, who self-identified as having helped congregations to navigate their reconciliation as a congregational ministry. I was able to interview five different clergy from across Canada. Two of the five clergy were no longer called to active congregational ministry, and two of the five clergy identif self-identified as Indigenous before the interview started. And while this is not part of my research directly, it's interesting to note that the experiences of the two ministers with Indigenous heritage did not present their experiences in leading their congregations in a way that made their experiences notably different from those without an Indigenous background. Uh, when beginning my research, I initially noted two biases that I carried and tried to be cognizant of them as I entered into the research. First, was that the indigenous clergy would have a much easier time aiding their congregations. And second, that in order to help congregations move from talking about reconciliation within the bounds of the church walls uh, to being more comfortable navigating reconciliation out in the world, I thought the activities and experiences need to be, needed to be these large moments that would initiate uh, emotional change within the participants. So why? Why did I take this on? Last summer, after taking a course about Indigenous culture, history, and spirituality, I wanted to work on a project that responded to one of the calls to action as determined by the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. Before I put the project into action within my charge, I reached out to an Indigenous United Church minister in order to get some feedback. I'd never met this woman in person, but had been to online meetings with her, as well as I heard her speak about her experience as a fourth generation residential school survivor. When I reached out, I was met with great resistance and questions about whether or not I was actually interested in engaging in reconciliation, or if I simply wanted to do a fun project that would have a reconciliation theme so that I could check off a box and say, well, we did that. 
As you can see from the quotes on the screen, the response I received showed me that the way that I approached the reconciliation project was naive, and though I thought well-intentioned, was not well-received. I knew enough that it wasn't the responsibility of Indigenous people to tell me how to do reconciliation or what to do, but then how do I enter into reconciliation with my congregations beyond just talking about the history and the current social issues of Indigenous people? What can I do with my congregation that is meaningful and engaging? How do I make a first step that isn't a missed step? Here, combined with the scripture that I will share shortly, in lies the birthing place of this project. Before we move on, I wanted to note that I talk about this topic in a church context, but the information could easily be shifted into different settings. This piece of scripture from 2 Corinthians emphasizes the call that Christians have to reconciling with all others who live in creation. The need and call to work towards reconciliation is clearly stated in this scripture and encourages those with a passion for, for social justice to continue even when things have become difficult or heavy. After interviewing the five ministers, five common themes emerged. They were congregational education, projects, activities, and actions, connecting with Indigenous people, and looking in your own backyard, as well as challenges and concerns. After teasing out the information about congregational education, the overarching message that came out of the interviews was share the information in a respectful, relational, and confident way. Each of the ministers interviewed emphasized that educating the congregation is the most important piece of work that can happen, no matter how that happens. While discussing opportunities for congregational education within each of the clergy, with each of the clergy interviewed, one minister mentioned that their region of the United Church of Canada puts energy and resources into supporting with the education of the congregations within their bounds. They publish Minute for Right Relations, a monthly reflection that can be shared during worship, highlighting opportunities for reconciliation that is applicable, current, and filled with reputable and denominationally relevant information. Another minister noted that the congregation they serve has taken the opportunity during their congregational book club to read books by Indigenous authors to help highlight Indigenous culture. The minister noted that the people who participated in reading the book by an Indigenous author were most likely people who were already attuned to the social injustices and plight of Indigenous people and supported reconciliation within their own lives. But this minister said that although they did not capture people who were new to the Indigenous storytelling and language, each exposure and each opportunity to highlight an Indigenous author is one that forwards and takes, sorry, that takes forward education and opportunity. Another minister I spoke with said that the majority of her experiences in congregational ministry included congregations that were not open to a lot of reconciliatory discussion. And so she offered passive opportunities for her congregation to engage by setting up displays of facts, stories, and pictures about Indigenous people, history, current issues, and reconciliation efforts and opportunities. She set the displays up in the narthex of the church and allowed people to peruse them at their will. Another suggestion of congregational education is to include information uh, to encourage reconciliation into regular worship services. With motifs of nature and the natu natural world, the season of creation is an obvious opportunity to weave Indigenous worship themes into a more traditionally themed worship service. One interviewer said, go outside, worship and acknowledge the land. Make Indigenous stories and language and history and current conditions part of the regular discussions so that they don't feel foreign or unknown. Four main foci came out of the discussions about congregational education. The first is recognition. 
More than one of the clergy interviewed mentioned that it's important to understand the comfort level of the congregation before engaging in the topic of reconciliation. The approach to education needs to be careful uh, and measured, careful and measured, um, so that the topic doesn't feel overwhelming or inaccessible. Resources. The fourth person that I interviewed made sure to tell me a few times that clergy need to prioritize where to put their energy and not to disregard resources that are readily available. Many mainline denominations have published easily accessed resources to aid in the journey of reconciliation. Many individual church libraries also have sections devoted to education about Indigenous voices and stories. Narratives. Another thread that wove through all of the interviews mentioned was the need to be neutral in conversations about reconciliation, not ostracizing anyone by sharing the information in a way that pushes people away from being in relationship with you as clergy or with the church. And integration. This was mentioned previously, but this point was said multiple times in each of the interviews. Integrating information about Indigenous reconciliation into meetings, worship services, church activities is a way to make the topic part of the everyday, one that is easily accessed and that allows reconciliation to be considered in parts of the ordinary. The next theme was projects, activities, and actions. And the overarching message that came out of those interviews was incorporate learning into daily life of the church. Do not push the agenda from your soapbox. As we begin to talk about ways to engage in reconciliation work with congregations, I wanna point out that one of the biases that I went into this project with was that in order to effectively help a congregation navigate the waters of indigenous reconciliation, large earth shifting experiences needed to happen. What I realized is that a tidal wave can start with one tiny ripple in the water. Small moments can be big moments and, there are no, and they are no less impactful than an event that took a month to plan and execute. This was the most surprising revelation to me that came out of the research. On the slide are different things to consider as opportunities to engage in reconciliation activities. Um, and that they become something that the congregation is looking for. Notice that integration was a main focus of this topic again. Each clergy person that I spoke to could not emphasize the need to integrate the topic into, and I quote, regular church life enough. One clergy person said, there isn't a powwow in this area that people from our church do not attend. That one statement sums up what all of the clergy said. Look at what is available in your area. Collaborate with indigenous bands or other community group allies and always, always be talking reconciliation. The next theme that emerged from the interviews was one of connecting with indigenous people. The overarching message that came out of this was one of the most challenging things is building relationship. Be empathetic, check in, listen. If we remember back to the presentations yesterday done by Caitlin, Michelle, and Jesse, this statement could be applied to all of their presentations. Sorry, this statement um, about creating and maintaining relationships between people within the church. What this says to me is that the relationships with Indigenous people need to be approached in a similar way as any other relationship would be. I very often use the phrase, don't borrow trouble, which reminds us not to create drama and conflict in situation there where there currently is none, just because we maybe anticipate that some might come up. This holds true for connecting with Indigenous people that we have no current relationship with. Listen and be genuine. There were five messages about connecting that I teased out of the interviews that I did. One interviewee said that when the local band office was approached about connecting for a blanket exercise that was a known activity in the Indigenous community already, 
the church and the people from the reserve were able to come together for a mutually beneficial exercise and experience where they all learned and where respect and relationship were fostered. The second person I interviewed made a great point when she said that the culture or nation, the culture of a nation or band can change drastically when the governance changes. A new chief and council greatly impacts the culture of the people that they serve. This is something to keep in mind when creating learning opportunities. And yet another person said that she's found that having a relationship with an elder in the community to be a significant point of contact who she can check in with to make connections and, direct, and get direction. Similarities. Interviewee two said that when engaging youths in reconciliation work, she always works to connect the lives of the youth with the lives of the indigenous people they're learning about. They are all praying for the same things, safety, their family, food security, and good health. Work to make connection through finding similarities. Safety. Before inviting an indigenous person into a church space, ensure that it's a safe space, said many of the people I interviewed. In the first interview I heard, I couldn't invite indigenous leaders into the church because it wasn't a safe space for them. The congregation wasn't open and interested. They were too caught up in racism and stereotypes about First Nations people that floated around town. Indigenous people have a long history with religious organizations. There's a need to make sure that more trauma is not being inflicted. Also that trauma will not be inflicted on the congregations. Be aware of the stories and headspace of participants. And finally, listen. One of the often, sorry, in the Eurocentric culture uh, that we live in, people spend time thinking of their next response while others are talking, rather than actively listening and processing what they are hearing. The woman who inspired me to take on this research project said this, to me, reconciliation is white people listening. Just listen to our stories. Listen. The, the next theme is looking in your own backyard. And the message that came out of this as a common thread was share with the wider community, share experiences, share resources, share feelings. When I interviewed the second person, uh, they told me of a story of a clergy person in their area who wanted to collaborate with other ministers of the United Churches in that area on an indigenous rec recognition project called Have a Heart Day. This minister served a church in an urban context, downtown in the nearby city, while all others served rural congregations. All of the ministers had access to exactly the same information. The urban minister uh, said this clergy that I interviewed, rather than looking to the rural areas for inspiration, needed to look in their own backyard. Um, and this clergy person continued, on the steps of the church lived many homeless people, a large percentage of whom were Indigenous. This minister needed to start where they lived and served. There was relevance and opportunity to make a real difference and connection without even crossing the street. This same interviewee had done a project within the church that she serves about the backgrounds of people. It's not enough to assume you know someone's heritage. She said, if I were saying a land acknowledgement as a group and there's an indigenous person in the pews, that needs to be acknowledged and the language needs to change. It would not be reconciliatory to apologize and commit to entering into relationship with those who initially lived on the land and not say anything to the person in the pews. That would be very short-sighted and honestly, a really inconsiderate thing to do. And finally, challenge and changes. Uh, there is no one size fits all solution. And we'll hear that again in the uh, project that Kirsten's going to do later. 
there is no one size fits all solution for entering into reconciliation. Prior to beginning my research, I was hoping that there would be an emerging, uh, that there would be an emerging recipe for clergy to follow in order to help congregations on the journey of reconciliation. As we will also hear from Kirsten later, um, each congregation has different skills and needs which impact their journey and engagement. Due to the varied nature of each congregation, the challenges encountered and challenges needed will also vary. A few that came up through my interviews that I would like to share with you are, firstly, tokenism. One minister I interviewed said that they have a young fellow in the church who's very, is, is visibly identical as in, identifiable as Indigenous. He's very active in all facets of the church, its work and its life. And any time there's a, an opportunity to engage in any type of Indigenous reconciliation in the community, this man is interested in participating and representing the church. If the people of the church asked him to represent them at every event based solely on the fact that he's of Indigenous heritage, that would be tokenism. To use the boy as a symbol of your congregation's relevance is abhorrent. It also, uh, this clergy person said, isolates anyone else in the congregation who doesn't identify as Indigenous, but who would like to be involved in reconciliation events. Secondly, issue adjacent. One minister told a story about how they struggled to share Indigenous picture books in a new charge as they had in previous charges. In the new charge, there were people with hearing issues who struggled to incorporate and understand the Indigenous language and way of storytelling that's different from the Eurocentric storytelling our culture is so used to. The issue was not that the congregation wasn't interested in reconciliation work, but rather that there was an issue with meeting the needs of congregants who struggled with their hearing. The issue of making services more accessible needed to be addressed before inclusive reconciliation work could begin. Thirdly, church and denominational culture. Another minister spoke of the changing demographics in the town they served. There was a surge of new immigrants moving into the town and this impacted the languages heard in town, the societal expectations around cleanliness and hygiene were different, as well as the way that gender roles played out in the homes of immigrants who all moved from the same area. This clergy person said that there was so much upset within the congregation about the changes in their town and trying to figure out they, their, own that their own identity within it that racism and self-identity of the people, the culture, and the culture of the church needed to be addressed before reconciliation work could begin. Fourthly, build relationship. This takes a long time. One minister said the easiest way to make a connection with someone in a band or a nation is through a friend or through a friend of a friend of a friend. And those connections um, initiates contact but does not imply relationship. Relationships take time to nurture and cultivate. And lastly, patience. We need to sow ideas like seeds and let them sprout. Change the usual, usual approach to new topics when dealing with ones as emotionally charged as reconciliation can be. And there were two main ideas or suggestions that were calling for attention after I processed all of the information I received in the interviews, listening and integration. What struck me was that both listening and in the integration of information into a lived experience are characteristics of indigenous culture and way of life. Listening, reflection, digesting and integration of information is not a fast process but one that brings about understanding and respect. As Sean Wilson says in his book, Research is Ceremony, only you can know how the information that is shared will fit into your context. You must also have faith that all will be as it is meant to be. It is your job to listen, to internalize, and to be aware. The conclusions that are right for you will come to you when they are ready. It would not be polite to force them into coming too soon or hang around after they are ready to move on. Be patient 
and wait until you have all of the information you are ready to accept before making conclusions and be willing to change those conclusions as new relationships develop that allow you a different point of view. For the storyteller to explain too much is not honoring you as the listener. It is removing all responsibility for you to do any learning. The main point of Indigenous discourse is to provide a foundation or a platform from which to grow without putting a ceiling or a limit on the amount or direction of that growth. And he finalizes his, this statement by saying, it is your responsibility as a listener to learn and to grow as you too are accountable to all our relations. Thank you very much.